everyone, and welcome to the Kimberly Guilfoyle Show, live on Rumble, where facts come first and where news is done right. And we have big breaking news on multiple fronts today, including more left-wing indictments over the 2020 election, this time in Arizona. We're going to break it all down. And plus Biden's new plan to declare a, quote, climate emergency and block American energy development and independence. Fossil future author Alex Epstein will be here to separate fact from fiction. But we begin today at the U.S. Supreme Court, where justices heard oral arguments on the issue of presidential immunity and whether or not the Constitution allows for President Trump to be criminally prosecuted over his objections to the 2020 election. Now, the outcome could determine whether or not Jack Smith can even continue his prosecutions and could establish landmark parameters on the scope of presidential immunity and whether a president can be prosecuted for, quote, official acts once he leaves office. Here was President Trump's attorney, John Sauer, during oral arguments today. And may it please the court. Without presidential immunity from criminal prosecution, there can be no presidency as we know it. For 234 years of American history, No president was ever prosecuted for his official acts. The framers of our Constitution viewed an energetic executive as essential to securing liberty. If a president can be charged, put on trial, and imprisoned for his most controversial decisions as soon as he leaves office, that looming threat will distort the president's decision-making precisely when bold and fearless action is most needed. Every current president will face de facto blackmail and extortion by his political rivals while he is still in office. And meanwhile, in New York, President Trump was out early at 6.30 a.m. amid his sham New York trial and received this morning greeting from some patriotic union workers. Take a look. Even when he has to sit in the courtroom, President Trump is still finding time to campaign and show support for we, the people. Joining me now, senior fellow at the Center for Renewing America, former chief counsel for oversight for the House Energy and Commerce Committee. He is also the author of Created Equal, Clarence Thomas, in his own words, a brilliant, truly brilliant lawyer, Mark Paoletta. What a pleasure to have you on the program, Mark. Hey, Kimberly, thanks for having me on. All Big right. Day. So, yeah, we're very excited to have you, uh, you know, and especially today with everything going on. I just want to get sort of your general top line, you know, takeaways from oral arguments today at the United States Supreme Court. And what stood out to you? Another good day for President Trump. Uh, he's on a, a string of them. Uh, you know, I think the court's going to find that, the, of course, the president has immunity for his official acts, for criminal prosecutions. He already has it for the civil immunity, right? And so sure. the idea that the this case is even before the Supreme Court, right, is just crazy. This came up from the DC circuit, right, saying that the president didn't have any immunity uh, for official acts for, for criminal prosecution, um, which is just ahistorical and would cripple the presidency. And I think the Supreme Court today, the justices, mm-hmm. particularly Chief Justice of Ren- um, uh, uh, Roberts, uh, Thomas, uh, Kavanaugh, um, Gorsuch, all, Alito, all saw that this will this is a terrible idea. It's not based in the Constitution, uh, and that they are going to send it back down. I think the official acts, the, right, right? The president, President Trump, is not arguing that personal, private acts uh, are are immune, but they're going to sort it out uh, down, send it back down to the to the district court. Uh, so kicking it past the 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 November elections. All right. Well, can you offer some insights on how we should kind of view the concept, uh, generally speaking, of presidential immunity? Now, the Trump team cited some case law, specifically Fitzgerald versus Nixon and even Marbury versus Madison. I heard that brought up a couple of times as offering some key precedent that is uh, controlling, illuminating on the issue. How would you describe sort of the high court's uh, jurisprudence on the issue at this point? Yeah, I mean, I think starting with Marbury, Mar- Marbury said that this is Marshall, that you that presidential official acts 
are not reviewable, never reviewable in court. Uh, Justice Story, another great uh, justice on the Supreme, Supreme Court, also said the same thing. Fitzgerald, 82 case, 1982 case against uh, against President Nixon, uh, said that uh, the president is immune from any civil uh, case cases liability uh, for the outer perimeter of his official acts. So it's very clear, and in fact, the Constitution, right, sets up impeachment as the mechanism by which you'd hold a president accountable. And that says that you are impeached and convicted. And then if you're convicted, Kimberly, right, then you can be prosecuted. So the, I think the founders, even though the, you know, the uh, the government is trying to say, oh, this isn't in the, uh, it, the immunity is not clearly in the Constitution. I think it is in its text and structure that they set up a mechanism in the impeachment closet that, that deals with this. I think they wanted to make sure that presidents weren't worried, right? If they want a vigorous, as, as John Sauer said, a vigorous president who can who can take action, um, can protect our liberties, protect our country, and not worry that when I leave office, I'm going to be prosecuted by, you know, my opponent once I leave office. And you know what? For 200 plus years, that's the way it worked, right? So presidents knew that they that they wouldn't face this stuff until. Until, of course, this lawfare has happened since President Trump came on the scene in 2016, and the left has just, in my mind, lost their marbles uh, <laughs> and wants to destroy the presidency to take out President Trump. That's what they're doing. And I think the justices today saw that this is a, um, a very dangerous road we're going down. Uh, you saw Justice Alito saying, hey, if this is the road we're going down, why wouldn't every president pardon himself going out the door, right? Literally. Uh, and, and, and again, you saw... Justice Kavanaugh picking up on, we had this um, terrible law, right, back in the 80s called the um, the Independent Counsel Act, right, that, as he said, hampered pr Presidents Reagan, Bush, and Clinton, right, with the prospect of being prosecuted by these independent counsels that were accountable to nobody. They were searching and hunting for the President of the United States. That's what they're doing here. And so, and, and Dreeben, who I thought did a terrible job, um, yes. uh, Michael Dreeben, again. Not good. Yeah, not good. A longtime litigator at the Supreme Court uh, in the Solicitor General's office. Your, your, your viewers should know that he's lost lots of Supreme Court cases, several at least, by 9080 decisions, right, against him. And so he was making these arguments that, of course, there are guardrails. The Justice Department are all good and honorable people. What we see, of course, is that this Justice Department, and I'd say for many, many years, has been weaponized against conservatives, right? And that they're going after President Trump and his supporters. And so this is not a, a adequate guardrail, as Dreven was trying to say. In fact, when he talked about the independent counsel, in fact, that Lawrence Walsh didn't indict anybody um, at the end of the day, he actually did. He indicted Cap Weinberger. I was in the, the Bush 41 wow. White House, uh, in the White House Counsel's Office. He indicted Cap Weinberger for this bogus charge of withholding documents, I think, that were in the Library of Congress at the time. Um, and the only reason he didn't prosecute him is because President Trump pardoned him on one of his last acts as, as president. I helped write that pardon. So the, the, Dreeben was dishonest uh, and living in a fantasy land with respect to the um, the guardrails that he says uh, are attendant in the in the sort of the, the structure of our government. Yeah, well, let's see if he gets another like a vicious loss again. <laughs> I don't know. He, yeah. It was not good. Um, but let's talk about someone who I think is outstanding, and that's Justice Thomas. He also made an interesting point during oral arguments asking why past presidents were never prosecuted for orchestrating violent coups in operating uh, mongoose in Cuba. Right. A great, great question. Operation justice Monday. Thomas, obviously my favorite justice and a, and a dear friend, uh, always hits the nail on the head with his, his questions out of the gate. And and that's exactly it. Why? Why have impressive? Why? Because they're not subject. They they do have this immunity and nobody would have thought that they that they didn't. And it's this norm breaking Biden Justice Department that brings this into focus. And you saw some of the justices asking after Justice Thomas raised this right about um you know, um, uh, FDR uh, interning Japanese citizens, right? Uh, sure. Even uh, in the brief of Sauer. Those are very good Lincoln, questions, though, right? when you think about it, in terms of historical precedent, nothing was done then, but now it is to Trump. Right. And again, if we're in this new world, what does Joe Biden face, right? By allowing 10 million illegals to enter our, our country, right? To, to commit crimes, gang members, right? People on the terrorist list. Uh, and he's doing nothing about it. His his throwing Israel 
under the bus, right? Why? Because he wants votes in, in Michigan. Is that a crime? Okay. Those are the kinds of things that every president, including President Biden, if they, if they adopted this view, which they won't, would have to face. And that's why it's such a ridiculous, dangerous argument about the president not having a, a, immunity from, from criminal prosecution for his official act. Of course he does. That's the answer. Of course he yeah, does. Yeah, it's nonsensical to suggest otherwise. Um, you enjoy, uh, I'm jealous, a, a close personal relationship with Justice Thomas and his wife, Ginny. Um, Justice Thomas, as we all know, as the world knows, has been the victim of some dis reprehensible, disgusting smear campaigns, including calls that he should uh, recuse himself from this case and others. But the facts don't support that, you know, whatsoever. Um, you know, these demands that are just, you know, reckless and have no logical basis in them whatsoever. Yeah, you know, Kimberly, I've been writing uh, on defending Justice Thomas. I've testified before Congress. I kind of equate it to the attacks on, on President Trump. The, the left is gaslighting the American people. They come up with these recusal standards, just like in this case today, you know, um, where just, they claim Justice Thomas had to recuse because of, of, of Ginny Thomas's political activism. He doesn't. There's nothing in the rules or the recusals that, recusal laws that required that. And, and, and they ignore all of these other examples of other justices, Justice Gin, uh, Ginsburg, sitting on cases where her husband, law mm -hmm. firm, appeared before the Supreme Court and she yes. never recused. Uh, you, you may, from California, remember Judge Reinhardt, the most liberal judge um, in the federal circuit at the time, uh, in the country, in fact, and his wife was the head of the ACLU, Southern California chapter, and she filed a brief in, in the case below on the same-sex marriage uh, case, and he didn't recuse. And you know what? Stephen Gillers and the left sort of uh, ethics world celebrated him and said, of course, he doesn't have to recuse because they have separate views. They're separate people. And the idea that he would be uh, you know, persuaded by his wife or you can impute her views to, to him is, is uh, sexist. And of course, when it comes to Justice Thomas and his wife, all bets are off. So they want to destroy the Supreme Court. They want to attack the Supreme Court in order to get at Justice Thomas. I'll just say he's the 10th longest serving justice in history now. About a week ago, he crossed that barrier. 750, or milestone, 750 opinions. Uh, he has moved the Supreme Court his way. It's the Thomas Court. Um, and I think his 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 example, both in his jurisprudence and in his personal courage, has been, you know, something we should celebrate as Americans. Oh, I and, and he, agree. he did a great job today pointing out some of the some of the great arguments um, as to why I think this is this is a problem to not have presidential immunity uh, for official acts. Yeah, he's truly a genius. I mean, an unbelievable legal scholar. I think one of the best, if not the best, that we've had to serve on the court. And I think history uh, will remember him you know, that way as well. And today was just another kind of shining example of his jurisprudence and his excellence. Um, you know, more broadly, we're seeing all of these high profile landmark cases, they're intersecting. And partisan politics are infecting, uh, like a disease, you know, our justice system. We also had the indictments yesterday in Arizona. How do you think this moment in history changes the trajectory of you know, practicing law, teaching law, in fact, even, uh, for that matter, in the years and decades to come. You know, it is it is a chilling time. Uh, those indictments yesterday, outrageous. People challenging, you know, elections that they believe were fraudulent and had voting irregularities, lots of evidence uh, that, you know, in, in, in fighting for what they believe in and they're getting prosecuted for it. This mm -hmm. is a, a banana republic. Um, and it's dangerous. I'm always an optimist, Kimberly, and that we will get through this and we need to fight hard and we will see it on the other side uh, and things will get better. But we need to stand strong. And all of these folks we need to support because it's outrageous. Jeff Clark is a, a, a fellow at the Center for Renewing America, where I'm, where I'm a senior fellow. And, you know, he is, you know, he has been indicted. He's been, uh, you know, disbarred all for you know, taking, making legal arguments and trying to defend the president. And, you know, they're criminalizing that. And that's what's Terrible. happening. Yeah, in we've this had country. him on the program. It's, uh, yeah, it's he's, he's so un-American. Yeah, it, it, it's so un-American. And they're doing it. They, they dragged Ginny Thomas into the January 6th investigation. I represented her in that case. Um, and for, for, for expressing her opinions, uh, you know, about the 2020 election. If you recall, when she 
back in um, 2012, she expressed her, her view that the Obamacare was a bad law and they wanted Justice Thomas to recuse and they wanted to impeach Justice Thomas for not it's recusing crazy. on this case. So, so all of these, 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 we call it lawfare, election interference. It's to intimidate lawyers now uh, and, and, and others, but, but in this case, the lawyers um, from, you know, defending, battling, fighting for the person they want to be president in, in a lawful legal way. That, that's what's that's what's that's what's chilling about this. It really is. Chilling is the right word. Uh, yeah, it's just an absolute, you know, disgrace. Let's talk about this, though, because I think it's to give um, the good folks at home some insight. If you can talk for a moment about the deliberation, you know, that occurs with these justices like inside chambers, you know, what is the process like? What are they going through kind of right now as the world is able to hear, you know, the audio and whatnot? of the deliberations and the questions asked? Sure, so t today, they, they, you know, the, the court sits Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, they added this case uh, as, a, as a special case um, on today, which is a Thursday when they normally don't sit. They'll likely sit tomorrow uh, and vote on it. T typically the court sits Monday, Tuesday, votes on Wednesday on the Monday, Tuesday cases, and then the Wednesday cases, they vote on Friday. So they have conference on Friday, um, typically, and I think they will tomorrow. And that's where the justices sit down in a conference room, just them, no, no law clerks, and they go in seniority uh, in, in terms of uh, how they're going to vote. And uh, they go around the table, and it's very civil, and you know, they discuss their reasons and the like, and then they take a vote. And then once they take a vote, uh, whoever the senior justice is in, that, in the majority will assign the opinion. Mm -hmm. You can assign it to himself or herself or to somebody else. Um, and the and the senior justice in the minority would assign the case to um, to, to somebody in the minority to write. There could be concurrences, there could be separate dissents, all that sort of stuff. But there's going to be a, you know a, 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 an opinion for the court that the senior justice will assign. And same thing for the kind of the dissent. Less so important is it's not the, the dissent for the court, but um, that's how it will work. My sense is that they will get this out by the end of, certainly by the end of June. I don't know if they're going to move quicker than that uh, on this case. It's an important case. Obviously, they 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 uh, fast tracked it to to take this oral argument. But yeah. I don't think um, I, I think that you know sending it down, which is what I think they're going to do, and remand it down to the district court, right? Where you're going to have this Judge Chunkin who was reckless in my view, in, in her uh, in completely wrong in her opinion. She's going to have to go back now and go through what's official, what's private. Um, and then also like with respect to the private, if you, if, you know, what is there in terms of, sure. um, you, you know, the actions. I think what President Trump was doing was trying to protect the integrity of the elections and they're criminalizing that, the, 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 uh, that conduct, which is wrong. Uh, but the point is it's gonna go back down to the Supreme Court. They will take it up on Friday, my sense. They will vote on it. They will sign opinions, and then there's a long process to write those opinions. They circulate those opinions, uh, you know, amongst each other, and you know, make edits based on the comments they get back from their colleagues. Uh, you know, Justice Thomas used to talk about, you know, there were I'm not sure how many briefs were filed. A great you have the the sort of the the petitioner, um, both sides filing the briefs, and then you have a bunch of amicus briefs, and some of them were referenced today in the court. So. A lot of material to get through. You, you had some of the you know, oral argument that will impact their 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 decision making. But I expect the decision, you know, by by June, maybe a little bit sooner. But I hope um, so. it, but but if that's going back down, Kimberly, as I expect it will, then that case won't be decided until you know long after the election. District court will make a ruling. It'll get appealed up to the D.C. Circuit again, and then that ruling will get appealed back up to the Supreme Court. So you're looking at something that's probably into next year in terms of a decision. So, um, yeah, it's going to be very interesting. It was fascinating, you know, to listen to it, you know, today and kind of get a sense and a gauge of where you think they're going to go on this. It's obviously a very important case uh, for American political history and for American jurisprudence. Um, but some uh, some very smart people in the room. Yeah, I think probably the most significant case, it, it, certainly this term and maybe for a long time. I mean, this is about the presidency. And just think about this, too. Congress, Congress senators and representatives have immunity. It's the speech and debate clause, but the way the courts interpret it is much broader than just speaking on the floor. You can't arrest a, a member of Congress driving to a vote, right? So the court has made it broader, okay, to protect those members of Congress. Judges and justices 
have immunity for their official acts. That's not in the Constitution, okay? So it's always comical, just like going back to the conflicts of interest and the things that they go after the, the justices on. Congress doesn't have any conflicts of interest. Uh, they've exempted themselves from those sorts of things. So you see all these members of Congress voting on things that they have financial interests in. But, but with respect to this immunity, all the other branches have it. And they're telling the president that he doesn't have immunity for his official acts. It's crazy. It's, it's like crazy, crazy town. And, it's and crazy. So, it's um, so I expect this idea that, that you know somehow his civil you know immunity from civil liability for official acts, and somehow he doesn't have it for criminal. It's it's um, it's, it's really backwards. Uh, well, and it's, so and it's I'm logically inconsistent. Gonna, so uh, you mm -hmm. know, it really, quite frankly, it's logically inconsistent. It cannot stand. I mean, it's just, I mean. I don't know. Let's see. I just that's why I have, you know, hope and faith. Uh, the justices ruled before 9-0. That was very good about saying you can't remove Trump from the ballot. So I think, you know, saner heads will, you know, prevail in this situation. And meantime, poor President Trump is suffering in that kangaroo court in New York, which yeah. is absolutely outrageous. Uh, Alvin Bragg should be thrown out of office. And just like uh, Fannie Willis, I mean, the whole lot of them are just a motley crew of, uh, you know, all of them. Disgrace them, to the legal system. They have, they have made it lawfare, and you know they have broken the bounds of what you know. They, but Fannie Willis and, and Alvin Bragg, they both ran right, and Tish James ran on, on going after yeah. uh, President Trump. I mean, this is the the, the height of 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 a uh, it's of, backfiring. Of, of fascism, really. You know what I mean? Of it really targeting an individual. Um, so it's it's um, you know, I, I I like I said, I do believe. And again, I will also say this. Thank God I was in the Trump White House for four years and worked on a number of those confirmations, including uh, Kavanaugh and Gorsuch. Yes, um, remember those. And, 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 you know, remember, as I made a reference to the independent counsel statute, which was a, a monstrosity of a law, it allowed federal judges to appoint a prosecutor to go after the president. Okay. That was upheld by the Supreme Court in an eight to one decision with Rehnquist writing that majority opinion. Scalia in dissent, that's a, the opinion that uh, Kavanaugh was talking about this, this morning yes. and referencing. Right? Just think about how crazy that opinion is, right? Eight to one. So, Thank God, right, that there were three appointments by Justice uh, by, by President Trump, because you know what? I don't know where this would be if you had sort of that old Supreme Court uh, allowing this sort of, uh, you know, these sorts of crazy opinions. Yeah, it uh, makes so me scared, like a little worried about it, apprehensive. You're absolutely right. Um, this is just, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I think after hearing what I heard today and I was listening, watching it extensively, I I have a feeling this is going in the right direction, but I don't want to jinx it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's, I, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty confident it's going in the right direction. Uh, and I think, um, you, you know, it's going to go back down to the, to the lower courts uh, on a remand and in fact, finding on that clearly the president has uh, a, immunity for official acts with any sort with respect to any sort of criminal prosecution that it's, it's so, to me, baked into our system. Uh, and in fact, that it hasn't happened for 230 years, 230 plus years tells you uh, what the answer is. Uh, so. And and thank God this Supreme Court, I think in the, the, the saner heads uh, talking about, you saw, um, you know, again, Dreven just d dancing around trying to make these arguments when, when Gorsuch, I think Gorsuch did a spectacular job today. He too, really was on his out. game. He's he's all you know what I'm a big fan of Justice Gorsuch. Me too. Um, I worked on his confirmation daily yeah, with him, he's great. and he's a brilliant, solid, and, um, and just fearless. And mm -hmm. um and so he pinned back Dreben. Remember he talked about the core. Oh, there's some some uh, powers that are core that Congress can't uh, uh, criminalize. And then uh, Gorsuch asked him, well, you know, something about some intent. He goes, well, maybe maybe on that. Uh, so he says, okay, so so now we're getting into looking at intent again. And that's just so dangerous, right? It is. Just like I know. President yeah. Clinton he, he was just... during the Monica Lewinsky stuff, right? Yeah. He's bombing countries, right? Mm -hmm. To clearly deflect uh, from from his trial. Is that a crime? If you're looking at intent, why did he bomb the, 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 that country? Um, and so that's the part that, you know, our the Constitution, our history, the Supreme Court presidents all say presidents have immunity for official acts. Uh, you know, and, and it doesn't leave them when when they're no longer president. That would that would make no sense at all. It would make right? no sense. Yeah. You 
taking bold, decisive actions, right? You need to make actions on the spot, you know, in the heat of battle, in the heat of the moment. And we want presidents to make the best decision without fear that, you know what, down the road, I'm going to get prosecuted by the person who, um, you, you know, is in office now, who I'm running against. Yes, you know, exactly. The you can't Democrats act always, in a, your official capacity if you're worried constantly about reprisal in the future or, you know, a retribution. It's ridiculous. The, the, the Democrats project. I mean, this is what they do. Right. They always talk about pre President Trump and all these imaginary things. It's the Democrats who who we weaponize the just form, who prosecute their political opponents, who try and put them in jail, who try and take them off the ballot box. Right. Look at the geniuses who had the 14th Amendment argument. Right. That somehow this was going to. Everybody on the sort of the establishment legal world was that this is a slam dunk, right? They yeah. cooked it up into this fever dream that this was any kind of credible argument when of course it wasn't. And of course they lost nine to zero. Sure. <laughs> so it's it's stunning to me how, how off the rails the left is right now and how much they want to get President Trump, right? And 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 you said I, I loved your the, the, the opening, President Trump go, going, uh, stopping and getting, uh, you know, uh, a, a, a big shout out from the workers today at that construction site before he went to court where the, the judge is making him stay when he doesn't have to be uh, in court. It's all it's 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 just all all to take him off the ballot, all to I try know. and prevent him from being reelected. And the Democrats who talk about President Trump, this is what they do. This is what they do with the law. And um, and, and I'm I'm always an optimist in these in, in, in these discussions and with my friends and all when we talk about exactly. this stuff. We will come out on the other side and we will win. Uh, we just have to fight hard uh, and, um, and, and, and come, come ready for battle every single day. Yeah, I can tell it brought a smile to your face today, too, like it did to mine. I see him out there in all the construction where I'm, the judge is probably silent screaming inside. Ah, can, can you, can you imagine campaigning. Biden going out there, right? That's the thing. No, 630, the it's like, there. give me yeah. a break. And it's such a great sign out there and everybody just like loving him and taking pictures and chanting and... I mean, there's nobody like him. Um, and I'm so glad you were a part of that whole American political history and getting those great justices in uh, to the Supreme Court. Let's see how they rule. Let's see what happens. I'm going to meet up, like you said, uh, hopefully tomorrow, Friday. But um, it's interesting to watch. That is for sure. And this will be important legal precedent that is set for this country that will affect generations to come. So I'm glad we got a front row seat to it with you, my friend. Thanks, Kimberly. All right, senior fellow at the Center for Renewing America, the fabulous, brilliant attorney, Mark Paoletta. Thank you. Thanks. All right, well, don't go anywhere because coming up, Biden's plan to declare a, quote, climate emergency. The brilliant author of Fossil Future, Alex Epstein, will be here with us. So please download the Rumble app, subscribe to my channel, turn on notifications, like and share so you never miss these major episodes. And remember, you can also watch this show on your big screen, on your television, by downloading the Rumble app on your smart TV or your iPad or tablet, whatever you got, any device, anytime. You can see this show right here on Rumble. And I want to say thank you because it's all of you who make this show possible, along with our truly amazing, incredible sponsors. So be sure to check out the good folks at the 1775 Coffee Company. Here we go. We love it. It keeps Junior fired up. We don't want him to be low energy Junior, okay? Uh, we talk about it on the show all the time. Don't compromise on taste. Don't compromise on quality or your values. And 1775 Coffee is brewed mwah, to literal perfection, crafted with precision and built on patriotism. The farm-to-cut process means there is quality, there is authenticity, and sustainability from start to finish. All the beans are ethically and exclusively single-sourced, and that is not all, because the 1775 Coffee Company is joining forces with us here at Rumble to support the causes that matter most to us. Your purchase helps support veteran causes, groups fighting to protect the First Amendment, the right to bear arms, and so much more. So please go to 1775coffee.com slash KG, okay? 1775coffee.com slash KG. 10% off your first order, all right? Tell all your friends too. 
And I also want to bring you a special message from Patriot Lifestyle, where you can save more and spend less on a whole host of different lifestyle benefits, including savings on travel, identity theft, legal services, and even pet care for your pooches. Take a look. Gilfoyle here, and I'm so excited to introduce the Patriot Lifestyle Benefits Program. With our benefits program, you get a range of lifestyle benefits at an affordable price so you can save money and stay secure. For example, as a member, you will access exclusive discounts with NB Cash Back so you can save more on your everyday expenses like groceries, restaurants, and even auto services. And with NB Travel, you can experience more but spend less by enjoying deep discounts on flights, hotels, entertainment, and so much more. These benefits are available to you and your immediate family to use anytime, anywhere. We also offer identity theft protection so you can stay on top of any unauthorized, fraudulent, or illegal activity. And access free and discounted legal services so you can protect your rights and receive top legal advice without breaking the bank. Plus, enjoy peace of mind on the highway with our roadside assistance program. And even take care of your furry friends with discounts on pet food, toys, medicine, grooming, and even trips to the vet. Our program is designed specifically for America First Patriots like you, who understand the importance of letting your dollars reflect your values and supporting companies who support you. And the best part of all of this, our benefits are at below market prices, so you can enjoy all of them while living the Patriot lifestyle to the fullest. So don't miss out. Visit our website at patriotbenefits.net. That's patriotbenefits.net. Thank you again for choosing the Patriot Lifestyle Benefits Program, where real benefits and real savings are our top priority. Join us today and start saving now. Go to patriotbenefits.net to learn more. These programs all come at an extraordinary value and will greatly improve your life. Now, it's another day with yet another example of Biden's climate change alarmism. As the White House is reportedly considering a so-called climate emergency declaration to take aim at offshore drilling and American energy production. Now, this has nothing to do with actually creating a cleaner planet and everything to do with trying to mobilize younger radical leftists to turn out in November and to grant Biden dictator-like powers to control your day-to-day -day life. Here to explain more, the author of Fossil Future, the founder of EnergyTalkingPoints.com. You can also find him on Substack, energy policy expert, the one and only Alex Epstein. Thank you so much for being on the program, Alex. Thanks for having me. All right. So let's see if you can explain for us, you know, the significance of this so-called climate declaration possibility. You know, who would it harm uh, in your eyes and opinion? And how worried should we all be at home about this? I mean, you published a piece on this and we're way ahead of the curve. Yeah, I think it's, it's very, very ominous. I mean, I, I think I described it as something like endless dictatorial powers. And I and I and I only say things that I literally mean. So let's look at the evidence. I mean, look what happened with COVID, you know, in terms of what emergency powers say meant, particularly at the state level, like in California, uh, where I live. I mean, what we've seen is that when you have an emergency declaration, mm -hmm. uh, politicians think that that gives them unlimited control. And one of the, the features of modern, quote unquote, emergency declarations is that they seem to have no time limit to them which doesn't make any sense because an emergency is supposed to be the criteria for an emergency, I think, is, is a temporary condition. You have to have control over it, and it really has to be a dire situation. None of this applies to the climate stuff because the, the issue is rising CO2 levels from fossil fuel use, which is not a temporary condition by any means. This is something China and India and, and also us, but certainly them, will be doing for decades and decades and decades. It's not in our control, mostly, right, because most of the emissions are from the rest of the world, and that'll continue to increase in the developing world. And in terms of being dire, most people don't know this, but we're safer from climate disasters than ever. So we have a much uh, much lower death rate from climate-related disasters like storms and drought, et cetera, et cetera, than we did 100 years ago, thanks in large part to protection from climate 
by fossil fuel heating and air conditioning and irrigation, uh, et cetera. So this emergency declaration is totally unfounded. It's the exact opposite of what you would want for an emergency declaration. But yet we know that when you make an emergency declaration, it gives you this unbounded dictatorial power. So they're starting talking off about offshore drill, talking about offshore drilling and some other things. We could talk about those. Those are disastrous on their own. But ultimately, they want authorization to shut down all fossil fuel use in the economy and call it an emergency and pretend it's for our health. Whereas, in fact, it's basically certain death for our economy. Mm. Well, you know, it is clearly an effort to appease climate activists, you know, to try to give um, these climate radicals, you know, more power and control over all the rest of us. Uh, They tell us there's a climate crisis. But, you know, what do the latest numbers, the facts actually tell us about climate related death and disaster? Well, yeah. So you're right to ask that question, because when people think about if you're asking about a crisis, right, you're talking about human life. Like you should be looking for something like what is our risk of death from these things? And we've been we can tally these things. It's not a mystery. Right. You can say how many people are dying from storms and floods and extreme temperatures compared to the past. And and as I've pointed out, and as nobody has been able to refute because it's just mainstream evidence, is the rate of climate disaster deaths has gone down 98 percent over the last 100 years. In addition to that, the if you look at just sort of mild temperature related deaths from heat and cold, we know that cold related deaths far, far exceed an, uh, heat related deaths. So if the planet is killing way more people from cold, and after 100 year plus years of using fossil fuels, we're safer from climate than ever, by what logic is it suddenly going to become incredibly dangerous? Nobody can ever explain this. They just say climate emergency. So, you know, at home and abroad, day after day, all right, we see these like, I mean, unhinged climate protests, you know, demonstrations. They're super nuts. I mean, it must be fun to watch them with you and you're just sitting there shaking your head. Um, they're always I, I used to I used to go to them. Oh, with for an fun. To fossil fuel yourself? sign talking. <laughs> yeah, there's video on YouTube of me at the People's Climate March with 300,000 people marching down Sixth Avenue and me holding an I love fossil fuel sign and talking to people, they which is fun to watch. It's not fun to be there because exactly. it's a very high loser quotient in those. <laughs> the LQ places. is very high loser quotient. Um, they must become unhinged when they see you with the I love yeah, yeah. Um, You yeah. know, they are kind of just really always done in the most bizarre, you know, in unserious ways. Like these people are just, like you said, they're just like loser. I don't know what's going on with it. You know, why is that? And why is it about, what is it about like this particular movement that seems to embrace like the absurd, like the most bizarre, absurd, you know, unhinged freaks out there? It's a, it's a good question. And I don't fully understand everything that's going on. I, I would say that though most of the blame should be laid at the door of mainstream institutions, because it, like, let's say Greta Thunberg, who, sure. you know, I think it's safe to say is, is unhinged in in various ways, and she's no longer a child, but you know she sort of came into this as a child. And if you look objectively, who of all the children in history, Greta Thunberg is at the top of the list in terms of having good prospects for life, right? Being born, whatever it is, 21 years ago in this world, mm-hmm. like you can't get any better than that, you know, in, in, you know, in uh, Europe, you can't get any better than that. And yet she thought she was born into the worst world ever. And you have a lot of people with this kind of mentality that the older generations just screwed them. It's going to be the end of the world. They can't be happy. There's no reason to be happy. And that's ultimately these different research systems, educational systems, as I call it in Fossil Future, our knowledge system. So the various institutions we're relying on for expert knowledge and guidance have in many ways taken some legitimate climate science and then perverted it to equate the idea that we have some impact on climate with the idea that it's the end of the world and that we can't deal with it, which again, makes no sense. We're safer than ever from climate. Common sense says we're really good at dealing with climate danger. So it's unfortunately mainstream educational type institutions, media institutions that have enabled certain people. And then I think people with certain psychologies, certain kind of, they might feel marginalized. They decide to take this on as their religious cause. Right. It's, it becomes like a core uh, identifier, sort of like, you know, who they are. And it becomes, it takes over them, I guess, having no personality or like core identity. And now they're like, I'll just be a climate change, like freak show. Um, so if you read your fossil future, read your Substack, 
um, you will learn a, a lot about all of this. And as you say, the climate change movement is fundamentally, and I think this is a very important, uh, you know, kind of statement that you make, is anti-human, right? They believe that any impact on nature is fundamentally wrong. You know, so why, why is that so, you know, misguided? Well, you, you exactly summarized it. Uh, so, well, so this is a point, I, I have an interesting background because I didn't grow up in a pro-fossil fuel environment or anything like that. Um, I grew up in an anti-fossil fuel environment, D.C. area, Chevy Chase, Merrill, and that kind of thing. But um, one thing I got, my my saving grace was getting into philosophy and being exposed to pro-human okay. environmental yeah. philosophy at a young age, particularly when I was 18 years old. And I remember, you know, I'm now 43, so it's 25 years ago, I learned this point, and it, it changed my life, which was human beings survive and flourish by impacting nature and the modern environmental movement says it's intrinsically wrong to impact nature, which means the modern environmental movement is against what's required for human survival mm. and flourishing. So to be anti-impact of any species is to be anti the species. Just like if you were against beaver impact, you say, hey, those beavers shouldn't build dams. They shouldn't eat anything. Like you, you want to kill all the beavers. Well, it means basically the same thing if you want to get exactly. rid of human impact. Even if you're a human, you can still be anti-human. And in fact, far too many are. It's really true. I mean, it seems such a bizarre uh, paradox. But I want to talk to you about this. I've been reading a lot and talking to so many different people, you know, politically. Um, people really think that climate is going to be sort of a, a big issue that this election uh, hinges on, that this could be the October surprise, that they'll try to say there's some climate uh, change crisis or something um, to really affect, you know, this election, uh, mobilize and get all these leftists and young people out there to help Biden, that he's going to use, you know, climate change and the alarmism to try to help save him for this election. Yeah, I, don't, I mean, I, he hasn't clued me in on his plans individually, as you, you might imagine. Uh, but um, and I guess I would have to keep it confidential if he did, since I keep confidential. <laughs> but anyway, um, no, it's it's uh, I mean, all I can say about that is I think that um, what's important for anyone talking rationally this election season, not even to talk about specific candidates is sort of two things with the the climate issue. So one is just getting rid of this conflation of climate change and climate emergency like these okay. just don't make any sense to put these together. And you have to be really on top of the facts about, OK, yeah, we've had some warming. Some of that is likely caused by humans in a world where far more people die from cold than from heat and where we're making ourselves safer from climate all the time. So one is we can be optimistic about climate. And then the other thing is, insofar as anyone is interested in reducing emissions, it's definitely not the approach to punish America, which is the current approach. What you need to do is liberate American innovation and in particular, you need to do it in the realm of nuclear energy, mm -hmm. which is the most promising form of non-carbon energy. And this is why a big focus of my work right now is coming up with a comprehensive new nuclear policy that could actually have the opportunity to make nuclear cheaper than fossil fuels. That's the thing that would That's actually address idea. emissions, yeah. by the way. Yeah. And I would just say one other thing, um, because we're talking about emergencies, and this is an idea that I'm thinking about because, you know, we're working on proposed executive orders and this kind of thing, like the things I think would make the biggest difference. I think one thing that should be seriously considered is recognizing that America is in an industrial emergency. And you can see this with respect to our competitiveness with China. We cannot build anything in this country. China can revamp you know, a railway station in nine hours. We can't build a yoga studio in nine months. Like we can't, it takes forever. It used to take six months to build a pipeline beginning to end. Now, if you got six years, you would be thrilled to the moon. So we, we to defend our country and to have an economy, we need a real industrial base. Current mm -hmm. environmental policy does not permit this. And no. I am for very radical reform. And, you know, sometimes I could go into detail, but I think that it is legitimate for somebody to say, hey, wait, this is an emergency situation and we need to suspend a lot of these ridiculous, unnecessary environmental review things that do not protect our air and water at yes. all. They just let anti-development activists slow things forever. So this is one of the things I'm working on is what can we do legally to actually stop this emergency on industry? There's no climate emergency, but there is an industrial emergency. And I don't think enough people are taking that on.
I think you're absolutely right. So it is always a pleasure to have you. I was very much looking forward to this today. Thank you for making the time. I know how busy your schedule is. Fossil Thank Future you. author, energy policy expert, and that he is, Alex Epstein. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, be well. And my closing remarks just ahead. But first, make sure you protect yourself against economic disaster. Look, our country is literally $34 trillion in debt. Biden inflation is only making it worse. And the Fed, what do they do? They just keep printing money. This means your cost goes up, but your quality of life goes down. And it's why gold prices continue to hit one high after another. And we're seeing headline after headline about the surge in gold. So like I always say, I just want you to be prepared. Protect you and your family. Don't just bury your head in the sand. Actually do something about it. Diversify a portion of your savings into gold with the Birch Gold Group. Gold is your hedge against inflation. And Birch makes it easy to own. They're going to take you through the process step by step answer any questions, and help you convert an existing IRA or 401k into an IRA in gold so you don't pay a penny out of pocket. To learn more, text KG to the number 989898 and get your free info kit. They're going to walk you through the whole thing. Again, text KG to the number 989898 to learn more. In closing, I have a message for the left. You thought all the lawfare would take down Donald Trump, but it's only making him even stronger. Starting with the corrupt Mar-a-Lago raid, the American people have been witness to this destruction of our legal system. And all that these so-called defenders of democracy are really doing is revealing their own rot and their own scandals. And we are one day closer to an America first future. And until that day, and for every day in between, remember that you have a home right here on this show on Rumble, where we reject the false narrative and always seek the truth. So please be sure to download the Rumble app, subscribe to my channel, turn on notifications, like and share, and tell all your friends so they know exactly where to find us. And remember, you can also download the Rumble app on your smart TV. It's super fun. And please also be sure to follow me across all platforms, X, Truth Social, Facebook, and Instagram. And don't miss Don Jr.'s Big Show at 6 p.m. Eastern right here on Rumble with Jason Vincent and Mike Scobie of Field Ethos. These are fun guys. You don't want to miss it. And I want to close with a major announcement. I'm very excited. My new children's book, The Princess and Her Pup, is now available for pre-order at kgpup.com. That's kgpup.com. I partnered with Brave Books on this heartfelt story that teaches children that it's easier to be courageous with a friend by your side and to face your fears. Follow Princess Kimberly and her pup as they find each other and they face their fears together. You can order your copy at kgpup.com, and the first orders will ship on May 6th. And that's not all. 10% of all proceeds will go to Furry Friends Animal Rescue. It truly is an incredible organization which provides complete care for abused, neglected, and abandoned dogs and cats. I hope you all have a great rest of the day. I'll talk to you again very soon. God bless.